From my own studies of the subject, I found that the records of Muhammad and Islam paint a very evil picture of the pagan Arabs vis-a-vis -vis Muhammad in a very one-sided manner. What, according to your research, are the facts? First and foremost, I would like to point out the following facts to our listeners, even though I have mentioned them in earlier chapters. All that humanity knows regarding Muhammad's life, deeds, and utterances, as well as all the character assassinations of those who opposed him, are based entirely upon the records as rewritten by the victors, the Muhammadan Muslims. Over a period of 300 years after his death, his followers posthumously turned Muhammad into a superhuman and perfect being and heaped upon him thousands of concocted stories of miracles and deeds that the Quran never mentioned. To reiterate, we have not a single record of these events from the point of view of Muhammad's victims, the pagan Arabs or the Judaized and Christian Arabs. Like all criminal minds and to justify any and all of his heinous acts, Muhammad projected upon his victims the very attributes, sentiments and actions that he actually harbored against them or intended to do unto them. All the hadiths show beyond a reasonable doubt that it was Muhammad who always initiated all acts of aggression against his victims, starting with his own kith and kin, the Quraysh, then other pagan Arabs, then the Jews, and finally the Christians. To prove our statements and conclusions, we never have to deceive, lie, or misrepresent anything regarding Muhammad's Quran or the Hadiths. Because, as we have repeatedly and amply demonstrated, the Quran and Hadiths self-destruct. It was Muhammad who insulted his people's gods. It was Muhammad who denigrated their centuries-old religious beliefs and traditions. It was Muhammad who consigned all their dead, their mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, etc., to eternal perdition just because they did not believe as he did. The fact that they let him live speaks volumes about their decency, tolerance, tribal loyalty, and compassion. Because of these sublime attributes, they were later subjugated and forced to convert to his cult belief system, hence losing their freedom, their dignity, and their morality. As we all know, no human being would last more than a few seconds if one insulted Muhammad, Allah, or Islam in any Muhammadan country or even in any other country. Please remember these facts at all times. As I open for you Pandora's box of Muhammad's version of justice, mercy, and compassion. Al-Tirmidhi Hadith 117 narrated by Ali ibn Abu Talib. Khadija asked Allah's apostle about her children who had died in the days of ignorance. Thereupon Allah's messenger said, they are in hellfire. And when he saw the sign of disgust on her face, he said, if you were to see their situation, you would hate them. She said, Allah messenger, what about my child that was born of your loins? He said, it is in paradise. Then Allah's messenger said, verily, the believers and their children will be in paradise and the polytheists and their children in hellfire. So-called believers and unbelievers, you should all know that only God has the authority to consign the dead to heaven or to hell and not Muhammad. Yet we find Muhammad arrogating this divine privilege to himself, both in his Quran as well as in the Hadiths. By what stretch of human imagination or intellect can anyone accept Muhammad's answer to his wife Khadija as either true or binding? Why would any innocent child be consigned to eternal damnation through no fault of its own? Who, besides Muhammad's perverted version of the divine, would any compassionate and merciful God ordain such immoral, unjust, and evil ruling? Why should Khadija's dead children prior to Muhammad be among the dwellers of hell, while his one ends up in heaven? Both died in infancy, and according to Muhammad were born in fitrah that is, in Islam, as the following verse asserts. Sahih Bukhari 6.298, narrated by Abu Huraira. Allah's Apostle said, No child is born except on Al-Fitra, Islam. And then his parents make him Jewish, Christian, or Magian. As an animal produces a perfect young animal, do you see any part of its body amputated? As we have demonstrated repeatedly in our series, 
Muhammad was a pathological liar, a demonic deceiver, and an obscene hypocrite who beguiled and tempted his otherwise ignorant, unlearned, and superstitious followers into believing him and his mendacities. In one verse, he extols the virtue and innocence of children, and in the next one, he consigns them to the tortures of hell. To believe and follow Muhammad is exactly the same as believing and following Satan. Most Westerners and other so-called unbelievers watch in horror the videos shown on Al Jazeera as well as on jihadi sites, the butchering, the beheadings, the dragging of the bodies of the dead, and their mutilation by frenzied Muhammadan mobs while screaming Allahu Akbar. They watch mesmerized at the unbelievable bestialities committed in front of their eyes in real time in the name of Allah and Islam. They watch while thinking that these satanic demonstrations are committed by only a fringe, a minority of radical or extremist elements, but nonetheless a minority of Mohammedan Muslims. Their erroneous perception is further reinforced by the deliberate lies and deceptions of the elite among the leaders of Mohammedan Islam and their supporters in the West. They willfully ignore the rulings perpetrated by the Mohammedan religious leaders in the most important seats of Mohammedanism in Saudi Arabia, Al-Azhar of Egypt, Qum of Iran, and others that state the following. A fatwa posted on a popular Islamic website in Saudi Arabia explains when a Muslim may mutilate the corpse of an infidel. The ruling written by a Saudi religious sheikh named Omar Abdullah Hassan al-Shahibi decrees that the dead can be mutilated as a reciprocal act when the enemy is disfiguring Muslim corpses or when it otherwise serves the Islamic nation. In the second category, the reasons include to terrorize the enemy or to gladden the heart of a Muslim warrior. The religious ruling was evidently posted to address questions about the conflicts with the West and is not confined by geography. In fact, in each of two gruesome attacks in Saudi Arabia that left 25 foreigners and five Saudis dead, a Western corpse was dragged for some distance behind a car. One was the body of an American engineer in Yambu, the other a British businessman in Khobar. With a ruling such as to terrorize the enemy or to gladden the heart of a Muslim warrior, it is hard to imagine when mutilation cannot be justified. In the Ask a Scholar section of the popular Islamic site, islamonline.net, it was asked, how Islam views the issue of mutilating dead bodies of enemies. Sheikh Faisal Maulawi, the deputy chairman of the European Council for Fatwa and Research, answered by declaring that mutilation is not allowable under Islam. But then came the loophole. It is possible to mutilate the dead only in case of retaliation. If one inflicts any physical damage on anyone, one should be retaliated against in the same manner. In case of war, Muslims are allowed to take vengeance for their mutilated dead mujahideen. In the same way it was done to them. This then, he explained, is the teaching of the Qur'an, Al-Nahl, chapter 16.126, which recommends patience but authorizes revenge. June 19, 2004, Saudi Arabia. Paul Johnson, an American engineer, was beheaded and the gory picture of his severed head was posted on the Internet. May 2004, Iraq. Nicholas Berg, an American citizen in Iraq, was caught and beheaded. The gruesome act was shown in Arab television, Al Jazeera. February 2002, Pakistan. Daniel Pearls suffered the same end. His assassins videotaped their grim crime proudly and showed to the world the level of savagery to which they can stoop. Mutilations, decapitations and other horrendous acts of barbarity have become the hallmark of Mohammedan Islam's terrorism. But where did these so-called fighters get their inspiration from? The answer to this question, as we have repeatedly revealed in several chapters of our series, especially the ones that deal with Muhammad's Sunnah, his alleged deeds, performances and statements that every male Muhammadan follower should emulate to the letter. Al-Imran 3.31 If you love Allah, then follow me, Muhammad. Al-Ahzab 33.21 
We have indeed in the Apostle of Allah a beautiful pattern of conduct for anyone who hopes is in Allah and the final day. Miskat al-Masabih, 1, page 173, the book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet. I leave with you two things. If you hold fast by them both, you will never be misguided. The Quran and my Sunnah.